Father, we thank you, God, for this opportunity. Lord, again, to bow our hearts before thee. Lord, I pray right now, God, that you would help us this morning. God, forgive me of my sins. Lord, cleanse me. Lord, help me to rightly divide the word of truth. God, I pray that we, as we come here today, that we'll glean something. We'll gather something for us today. God, that will encourage us in our Christian life. Lord, if there's someone here today that's lost and doesn't know you, I pray that today they'll come to know you as Savior. God, we'll thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this story uh, in chap John chapter number 8 deals with a woman taken in adultery. Now, most of the time you read this story, and you'll if, if you don't study it a little bit, and if you don't dig into it a little bit, you'll come up with, uh, you know, you'll come up with something that may not seem very, very deep to you except the story and you go on. But there's some very interesting things in this story. And so we'll, as we begin to read together, I'll title my message this morning, A Message Written on the Ground. A Message Written on the Ground. Now, I've often wondered as, as we read this, I've often wondered in times past, what was Jesus writing when he wrote on the ground? And I don't know, the Bible does not tell us what, but I can use my imagination. And believe me, I've got an imagination. And I can use my imagination and I can surmise and I can, I can come up with some thoughts of what Jesus might have written on the ground. Now, when we get to heaven, he'll probably reveal to us exactly what he wrote. But friend, this morning Jesus had something very important to say uh, to us concerning this. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives. Now, we've got to backtrack a little bit. Why did he go to the Mount of Olives? Where was he at? Well, his brethren over in chapter number 7 had encouraged him to go to the Feast of Tabernacles. And that was the feast that was, uh, was uh, held up in Jerusalem. And it was a feast commemorating the days when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And they were in the wilderness and they dwelled in tents. And that, thus it is called the Feast of Tabernacles because the tabernacles were their dwellings. And so they encouraged him to go up there to the feast. And Jesus tells them, he says, you, you, all, can, you all go on. I will be up in my time. My hour is not yet coming. I'm not coming right now. But it says that his brethren did not even believe in him in chapter number, uh, chapter number 7, verse number 5. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Now who are his brethren? I don't believe it to be the apostles because they did believe in him. Could it be that it was his earthly brethren that did not believe in him? Uh, could it be his half brothers that did not believe in him? But the Bible says his brethren did not believe in him. So they went on up to the Feast of Tabernacles. And then Jesus goes and, and we find him here now. We find him at the Feast of Tabernacles. He has been uh, teaching in the temple. Uh, he, and people have believed on him. People have trusted him. If you'll go back and read chapter number 7, uh, you go back and read that. They had trusted him. They had believed in him. And, uh, and, and so he was doing the work that Jesus did when he came into the world to seek and to save that which is lost. And so as Jesus went uh, to that feast, it came to the day when the, when the day ended. In verse number 53, that part of the feast, in, cha in verse 53 of John chapter number 8, and every man went into his own house. So people departed. This Feast of Tabernacles had, been, had become something as a, uh, you know, as a street festival. And people would get all, uh, you know, get, they would get all involved in it and they would go outside the town or into the streets and they would live in these little uh, leaf huts that they would make just trying to commemorate what Moses did in the wilderness. So Jesus, he had, the Bible tells us that he had nowhere to lay his head. I'm telling you, grip me when I begin to understand what this means. And Jesus went, verse number 8, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. Every man went to his own house, but where did Jesus go? He went to the Mount of Olives. Now, uh, it was near some friends maybe that he might have went to, I don't know. But I believe that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives to pray. I believe he went to the Mount of Olives that night to pray and to seek the will of his Father whom he was subject to the will of God. And he went to pray and to talk to the Lord. We know many times we find him in Scripture praying. We find him in the Garden of Gethsemane which wasn't far off. We find him in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. 
And what we know about that is that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and I feel that he went there to pray and seek the face of God. Maybe he had nowhere that night to lay his head as the Bible tells us. Maybe he slept out under the trees. Maybe he slept under one of the olive trees. But where, whatever it was, friend, there's where he spent the night was on the Mount of Olives. But he did that and then he got back early in the morning, the Bible tells us. And early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and taught them. So he was right back at it early in the morning. And friend, when I began to study this, I began to get under conviction in my own heart about how little that I study, how little that I pray, how little time I, I spend in fellowship with God the Father. And Jesus got back up early in the morning before anything else. He went down to the temple and there he began. And guess what? People were eager early in the morning to hear the teachings of Jesus. I'll tell you something, friend, today. People are not as eager as they used to be to hear the Word of God. People are not as eager as they used to be to fellowship with God's people and to hear and to learn from the Word of God. But they were, they were up early in the morning with Jesus and he again taught them, all the people came unto him and he sat down and taught them. Now, there's always that pharisaical crowd. There's always those, those highfalutin religious people around that, that if they can stir up something, they will. And uh, here's these scribes and Pharisees. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had sat her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now, we read that, and listen, adultery is still a sin today. Fornication is still a sin today. Young people, stay clean till you get married. Husbands and wives, love your, hus you love your husband and wife, and she is, the only, uh, she is the only woman for you, husband and and uh, wife, he's the only man for you. Anything else is adultery. Now, they found this woman taken in adultery. There's people say, well, preacher, I messed up. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about messing up in the past. You serve the Lord today. Everybody say amen. Amen. And so they took this woman in adultery. Now, in order for them to present her as a bona fide lawbreaker, they had to catch her in the very act. Now here's where the story began to get a little interesting to me. How did they catch her in the very act? Now I'm going to give you an, uh, a, what, what could have happened, a scenario. Uh, these scribes and Pharisees, and I'll tell you why I believe this in a few minutes. These scribes and Pharisees, they brought her to Jesus. It could be possible that one of those very scribes and Pharisees was the one that was in an adulterous relationship with this woman. I'm, you say, well, now, I don't know about Well, just let, let's get to it. And so they, they said, here, is, here she is, Jesus. He, they paraded her out there, embarrassed her. I mean, they embarrassed her. They shamed her. And they brought her before Jesus. And, and they said, here she is, Jesus. Now, why did they do that? They were tempting Jesus. They were trying to make him, put him in a place where if he said, okay, uh, you know, and, and we'll get there. Okay, here's you got a stoner to death. And if he did that, then he would be in opposition to the Romans because, you know, they, they didn't do that. They didn't, they, that was something that they were being con in, in contract. They weren't going to let that happen. Or he could, he could say, okay, she's, she's free. And then they could say he usurped the authority of Moses. Now, of, of the law, what did Jesus come to do? He came to fulfill the law. Am I right? He come to fulfill the law, every jot and every tittle, he come to fulfill the law. So Jesus in his wisdom, in his omniscience, being the wisest man that has ever walked planet earth, and I, I, hate, to, I hate to make some people feel bad, you know, but there's people think that they're the wisest people in all the world, especially people in our government, that's all I'm going to say, but they think they're the wisest, I had to throw that in, think they're the wisest people on earth and nobody knows no better than they do. Let me tell you something, Jesus is the wisest man that ever walked. And so how is, they, they do this to Jesus and, and they wonder how is he going to, how is he going to handle this? We've trapped him, see? Their whole meaning while Jesus walked on the earth was to put him in a trap and to get him where he was backed into a corner and then he would reveal 
uh, who he really was, but he was really Jesus. And so they could not do that. And so what did they do to Jesus? Let's read on. Now Moses in the law, here's where they start putting uh, the word to Jesus. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? What do you say about it, Jesus? Moses said he ought, ought to be stoned. What do you say about it? The arrogance and the hypocrisy of these scribes and Pharisees is absolutely abominable. I mean, they are absolutely in a place where no man should ever went to start with. But they put that to the very Son of God Himself, to God in the flesh. They say, what do you say about it? In their arrogance, uh, this they said, tempting Him that they might have to accuse Him. Look what Jesus did. But Jesus stooped down and with His finger wrote on the ground as though He heard them not. Now just like He didn't even hear Him, he stooped down and, and he began to write on the ground. So when they continued asking him, and it, I, I can just picture in my mind Jesus down writing in the ground. Hey, let me say to you, that finger that was writing on the ground was the same finger that wrote the Ten Commandments and gave them to Moses. You ever think about that? That same finger that was writing on the ground was the same finger over in the book of Daniel that put the writing on the wall. Yeah, take that home, chew on a little while. That'll make you get to shouting after a while. But this same finger of God, as he, as he was down on the ground, as he stooped down on the ground, however it was, he, be, he began to write. And they thought, well, what's he doing? Why is he just, why, what's he doing? Is he not going to give us an answer? So I believe they became more belligerent. What are you going to do about it? And I, and I believe in, in the mockery of their tone, they begin to mock him. Well, he don't know how to answer us. What is he going to do about it? What is Jesus going to do? And I can just hear them in their boisterous. I can hear them, their arrogance. And I can hear them defying the very Son of God himself. So Jesus, in his wisdom, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. And, and, and uh, verse 7, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said to them. Now he's down there writing on the ground. And they continued answering him. He stood up. And he looked at him, and he looked at those Pharisees right in their God-given eyeballs. He looked at them and said, okay. He said, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. I begin to study this a little bit. And the sin that he, we're dealing with here is the sin of adultery. Now, I don't believe he asked them, if you've committed any sin, I believe he was asking them, who are you, uh, of you, of these, however many they were, who of you men standing here, who of all of you men standing here is without the same sin, you go ahead and cast the first stone. Now, I see some, I see some irregularities here also. This woman was paraded out. Now, I thought about using some examples this morning, but somebody would get real mad at me, and I didn't know who to use no way. They wouldn't get offended. So uh, pretend I'm the woman. They paraded her out. And she's in shame. But you know what? The law also commanded that the man that was involved, he be brought out there too. Why didn't they bring him? That's where I've got to say that I believe probably the, the man that was involved in it was in that crowd. And so when Jesus struck that note in their heart, and he stood up, okay, who, you that's without sin, you go ahead and you throw the first rock. You cast the first stone. Now, how, did they, how were they to go about that? Here's how they used to stone people. Put them up on a platform about 10 foot tall, about a little taller than that door. Tie their hands behind their back, tie their feet together. And the accuser, the main accuser, the one that said, I've got them, they did it, they're guilty. And after they were proven guilty, that one had to get up on that platform and push her off on the ground. And if she didn't die when she hit the ground, or he hit the ground, or whoever it was, if they didn't die when they hit the ground, then the next accuser would carry a big rock and, and, and throw it on them, on their chest. That's horrible, isn't it? That was the law. That's the way God had it carried out. It's God's business. Amen. But that's how they, they dealt with sin. And so... And if that didn't work, then the rest of them would throw stones. They would, they would stone them until they were dead. Now, what a horrible way to die. But it was a deterrent to their, to their sin. Well, 
whoever the other, uh, other party in the adultery was, you don't see him in this picture. And why? That's because they were unjust. That's because they were hypocritical. That's because they were pharisaical. And they said, well, it's all her fault. Let me tell you something. In, in any adulterous relationship or an affair, it takes two people. Amen. It's not easy. I've never seen it. I've never seen it where it was just one person's fault. Amen. Now listen. So as Jesus wrote there on the ground, what was he writing on the ground? Now, I don't know the names of these men that were gathered around, but they say they began to leave, and that's all he said. What, what did he say he did here? He that is first is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone, and he stooped down again, and he wrote on the ground. Again, he's down there writing on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out being convicted by their own conscience, pay attention to your conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Now, what did Jesus write on the ground? Now, I've not got to my message yet. This is all my introduction. So do you, do you suppose while he was writing on the ground, and after he said that, he began to write on the ground, he stooped down there, and do you reckon they all crowded around him to look what he was writing? And uh, Jesus knowing all. Now, you've got to know, Jesus is an omnipotent, omniscient God. He knows everything. He has all power. And do you suppose maybe one of them's name was Levi? Do you suppose he wrote Levi down there on the ground? Levi said, uh-oh. He knows about my adulterous relationship. Now, I'm getting out of here. I ain't going to be a part of this. And off he goes. And one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, and I'm just throwing out Bible names, David, Benjamin, whoever. He wrote their name down. And they said, oh, no, he knows about me. I believe every one of them was guilty of the sin that they were accusing this woman of, of being, uh, they were accusing this woman of. And when he left there, when he got through, and they had all left, he had shamed every one of them. See, what he did, what Jesus did, was he put the law back on them. He put it back all on them, and that's, that's, you know, that was the right thing to do it. He said, okay, if she's guilty, you cast the first stone. Now, he didn't say, you know, nobody's going to get hurt here. He said, if you're guilty, you know, if she's guilty and, and, and you know it and you're the accuser, you go ahead and, if you don't have any sin among you, you go ahead and cast the stone. But they wasn't one of them because of their guilty conscience, because of the guilt of their heart, because of the conviction of their heart, they, none of them was able to go up there and cast the first stone because they knew they were as guilty as she was. Now, friend, let me tell you, he wrote their names, and from the oldest to the youngest, every one of them departed. So there's Jesus on the ground. He's not watching. He's not looking. Now, he knows all, but he's not looking at him. <clears throat> so when Jesus had lifted himself up, Stood up and he looked around, or he leaned up and he looked around. And saw none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Has, hath no man condemned thee? Now sure, what she did was wrong. What they did was wrong. But Jesus, who was, who, if, you, if you thought that he would have picked sides that day, who do you think Jesus had picked sides with? Sides with? It was the woman, it was the sinner. But he let the law work because he came to fulfill the law. He let the law work as it was supposed to work and no man accused her. And Jesus said, where, where are those thine accusers? And what did she say? She said, no man, Lord. She looked around and said, there ain't no man. Don't you know that's a relief to her? When there was nobody there because she knew that when she went there she was going to be stoned to death. Now, I don't read where she tried to rat out whoever else it was that was with her. I don't know. That might have happened. I don't know. But she didn't tell on whoever else it was that was with her. Or maybe they were all looking at her. And maybe, you know, maybe as they were looking at her, it could have been that the husband and the adulterer was both right there in the crowd. I don't know. But Jesus looked at her and said, Neither do I condemn thee. Now, he rebuked her because he said, Go and sin no more. 
Boy, what a wonderful thing for Jesus to do. Go and sin no more. Now, friend, everybody in this building tonight, this morning, is guilty of sin. I'm guilty of sin. I do things that's not right, and I've done things in my past that's not right. But you know what? That the Bible proclaims to you and I that we should do when we sin and when we mess up. Go and sin no more. Don't keep doing it. You say, well, God will forgive me. He will forgive you to a point, but it comes judgment day sometime. And if not here on earth, when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you will be judged for those deeds done in the flesh. Go and sin no more. So that was what I believe our, our message this morning is, is partially this morning that we as believers, when we fall short of the glory of God, when I sin, and I do, and I confess, and I go to the Father and I say, Father, will you forgive me? I know I've sinned, I've done wrong. Listen, I do that for myself. You don't have to do it for me. I can't do it for you. You can't do it for me. But I go and say, Lord, will you forgive me? And guess what? He does. He forgives me. And those things come under the blood. But, what, but, but, but the worst thing is to get up and go do the same thing over and over and over. Now, people have weaknesses. I know folks have weaknesses. I know, you know, I know some men in life... <coughs> That have, that have had some weaknesses that they battle with all their Christian life. And everybody does. And I asked somebody one time, I said, what do you do? I asked a preacher one time, I said, what do you do when you battle something? He said, you just battle. He said, you don't give up. He said, you battle that sin. You battle it. And it'll come a time where, friend, you'll get victory over that if you'll just keep battling. So what did this woman do? I believe she went her way, and I believe she learned a great lesson from that. And what did these men do? They left in shame. <coughs> they left in shame because of the Word of God. Now, I want to give you four things real quickly and we'll be done. What was the message on the ground? What was the message that was written on the ground? Number one, I believe it was message letters of conviction. Message letters of conviction. Because even though Christ, as He wrote those things, and we don't know what He wrote, what did it do? It brought conviction to those unbelievers. It brought conviction to those sinners. Christ's words will bring conviction to the sinner. It also brought conviction to the sinner, of the, to this woman. But the message on the ground was a message of conviction. Jesus wrote conviction, words of conviction on the ground. Friend, why, how do people get saved? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. What does the Word of God do? It convicts men of their sin. The Spirit of God takes the Word of God and it convicts the sinner of his sin. Now a lost man can never, I've said it a thousand times, a lost man can never be saved until he knows he's lost. What causes a lost man to know he's lost? The Holy Spirit of God taking the Word of God and showing that man that he's lost because the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. That's how a lost person can know they're lost is because the Word of God by the Spirit of God convicts them of their sin. Now, when I sin... What causes me to know that I've sinned? It's the Holy Spirit of God coming into my heart and telling me you should not have done that. That's wrong. You know better. And I feel convicted many times by my own conscience being convicted and I know that I've sinned. So Jesus, as He wrote on the ground, He wrote message letters of conviction. What else did He, what else did he write? Number two, He wrote me, me, word. Message words or message letters of a guilty conscience. Now, there's one thing about these men, these brethren, or whoever it was that stood around him. They did their conscience was not seared because they were guilty. They were proven guilty by their own conscience. He wrote a message letters of a guilty conscience. Their conscience condemned them. Their conscience showed them that was guilty. Have you ever done anything where your conscience just bothered you over it? 
Now, I, I was out the other day, me and my wife, we don't do it a whole lot anymore, but we stopped at, we stopped to eat somewhere old Charles, wasn't we? Yeah. Well, I go home, and I, you, I had to use my debit card, and I go home, and my, my charge wasn't on there when I looked at my, you know, my bank account online. My charge wasn't on there. And the first thing I thought was, oh, boy, free meal. And then guess what? My conscience convicted me. I knew better than that, of course. And I told my wife. And I said, I, if, if it's not on there, I said, I'm going to have to go back and make them put it on my thing. I'm not going to be, my conscience is not going to bother me over, boy, it's a good meal too, by the way. They got good ribs over there. Anyway, I digress. But, but my conscience is not going to bother me over, you know, Whatever, how much ever, how much the meal was, I don't remember. I wasn't going to have a bad conscience over that. So, what happened was, I looked the next day and it it had, it had charged the next day. Now, the reason I thought it hadn't charged was because it charged me a dollar automatically as for using my debit card. I don't like that. So I thought, well, you'll not get the other thirty dollars or whatever it is. But I, no, I didn't. I I, I would have went in and paid. So. I checked it out, and it was on there, so I didn't have to go back over there. But I was going, why? Because my conscience was bothering me. I used to do things at the house, and my conscience bothered me. I didn't have to go tell Mom and Dad. You know, I have to go tell Mom and Dad. I've done, I've done things with my wife, and she's done things before the conscience bothered over. I stole her last piece of chocolate. And my conscience bothered me. I had to go buy her a whole bag of chocolate. She said, you take a light piece anytime you want to. That's just an example. But if your conscience bothers you, friend, that's a good thing. If your conscience don't bother you, that's a bad thing because your conscience has been seared and nothing bothers you. You know what's the matter with a lot of the things in the world today? Nothing bothers them. It don't bother them to kill people. It don't bother them to murder folks. It don't bother them to commit any kind of, uh, of sin that you can think of. Why? Their conscience has been seared and it doesn't bother them. But I tell you what, we'll bother the conscience down if they get under the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God can convict them through His Spirit. So anybody that's alive and breathing, even though their conscience may be seared, I believe still by the Holy Spirit of God can fall under conviction. So the words of, of conscience was written on the ground. Uh, then there was a, a message, words of condemnation was written on the ground. Because they were had already condemned this woman. She was in their in their mind, they were all she was already condemned. In their mind, she was already stoned. And Jesus got down there and wrote on the ground and it turned on them and they felt condemned. They felt convicted. They felt condemned because of their own Sin. Friend, I'll tell you something. I'll be just perfectly honest with you this morning. We should all, as believers, concentrate more on our own sins than we do everybody else's. Everybody say amen. But so easy is it is to look at someone else and say, boy, look how wicked they're doing when there's a light pole in their own eye. Hey, I'll tell you something, friend. We, by the Word of God, are convicted by our conscience and we by the word of God sometimes feel condemned over the things we've done and so as as they were feeling condemned because of what <coughs> false accusations they had brought and because of their own sin the woman standing over here she felt condemned she felt under condemnation because apparently she didn't you know offer no defense So then, what did Jesus write? I believe he wrote a message in letters of confession. As I believe this woman confessed that she had done the evil that was brought against her. I believe her confession was that she had done that. Because when Jesus asked, where are there that accuser? said, there's no man. I don't believe she offered, no, I didn't do it anyway. I believe that, that she confessed. <coughs> Right then and there, I believe that was her confession. So I believe Jesus wrote letters on the ground, and you could say there were letters, messages of confession. Friend, if a, if a person is lost without God, they must confess their sin. 
They must confess they're a sinner. They must, they must come to the knowledge of that fact that they are a sinner and they must repent of their sins. <coughs> Repentance is something that's not preached much anymore. But Jesus came preaching a message of repentance. And so I believe at this point this, this woman confessed and I believe she repented of her sin. I believe she went away, away from there. I believe there was joy in her heart when she left there. Then last of all this morning they were message letters of conversion. And I say that because I believe that woman right at that point confessed, realized she was a sinner and I believe she went to her way and I believe that that was her, the turning point in her life where she got her heart right with the Lord Jesus. Now, I don't, this is all I know about this woman taken into adultery. We find out more about the Pharisees and their illeg illegitimate cries against God, their illegitimate promises against Him and their accusations against Him. We see that much more. But this woman, I believe, is an example of how no... How, no matter what you've done, no matter what sin it is, that Jesus will forgive if we'll confess and call upon Him. Father, Lord, we thank You for the Word of God this morning. Father, I pray, God, that You'd help. Lord, we thank You for Your strength and Your guidance today. We thank You, Lord, for the touch of God. Lord, we fell here. I pray right now, God, that You again, Lord, would bless the message. God, if there's someone here this morning, God, that's lost without you, God, I pray that you touch them with the convicting power of the Spirit of God. If there's a saved person here this morning that's battling, Lord, some sin, Lord, I pray, God, that you give them deliverance over that today. And Father, would you impress upon all of our hearts, God, that we're living in the last days and we must live closer to you. None of the other stuff matters much, God, when we, when we put it to light against the Word of God and against the principles, God, that you want us to live by. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name.